a little bit late. So he would be telling us about computation intelligence and the future, and telling about, I mean, all his ideas, which are uh, very inspiring. And I thank you very much for coming and uh, giving us a lecture. Pleased to be here. Um, apologies for all the computer problems. I realize there's one thing, which is a cable. There's an additional cable, which we, which is not here anymore. But just we should make sure we don't leave without it. Okay. The VGA cable. Okay. Our VGA cable. OK. Otherwise, otherwise, we will have guaranteed failure in any other talks I try to give. All right, great. It's um, OK. So what I wanted to do, uh, I gather this is a physics institute, so I want to make sure I talk a bit about physics. But I also want to talk about kind of a, a long journey that I've been on in applying the ideas of computation to lots of different areas. So the, um, at, uh, at a practical level, we've, um, I've been interested in uh, uh, just delivering computational intelligence to everyone. So you may have seen our Wolfram Alpha system where you can um, just ask questions like, you know, what is the population of Brazil, for example? And uh, uh, it will understand kind of that natural language question, give us an answer, try and tell us some interesting facts about it. We could say, for example, something like that. What's the population of Brazil divided by Portugal, for instance? And we'll understand the natural language of that question um, and be able to give, uh, give an answer. And so what's involved in doing this? Well, there are, there are basically uh, three pieces. One is you have to have a lot of data about a lot of kinds of things in the world. And we've been collecting data about thousands of different domains of knowledge. Um, another thing you have to do, so, so a typical kind of thing, let's pick another domain. Let's say, ask about the International Space Station. Um, here, there's a mixture of just data that comes in from some uh, radar measurement about the orbital elements, together with an actual computation of solving the differential equations for celestial mechanics to work out uh, where will the ISS be right now. And that's, that's the result it's giving here. And then it'll give us some other information about it. So there are lo lots of different kinds of knowledge that we've been um, dealing with in Wolfram Alpha. If I type in something like this. Um, I should be able to get, uh, it should be, assume that that's a genome sequence, and it'll probably find the matches um, on, let's see, there we go, OK. So there it finds the matches for that particular genome sequence on the human genome. So we've, um, and uh, at, least, at least in the US, Wolf Alpha has become sort of a, a, um, a universal tool that's used by students because it can do things like math computations and so on. Um, it'll give, uh, so it gives the answer. Um, you can also ask it to show a step-by-step -step solution. Um, that's uh, the thing to understand about these step-by-step -step solutions is the actual way the computation is done inside the computer has no relation to these steps. These steps are purely made for human consumption. Um, they're not, uh, um, and um, the, the computer, uh, actually has a much easier time working out the answer than computing those steps. So this is, um, so one of the things that we built is Wolfram Alpha, which is this uh, system that goes from natural language input using uh, computable knowledge to compute answers to questions. And it's used in lots of places. For example, the Siri intelligent assistant that Apple has uses it to generate knowledge answers, as do many other intelligent assistants and other kinds of, of systems. But the, uh, so one question is, is sort of how fundamentally does Wolfram Alpha work? And the answer is it's taking the natural language that you type in, and it's converting it into a precise symbolic language from which computations can be done. And Wolfram Alpha is, so, so the foundation of Wolfram Alpha is that precise symbolic language which is this thing we call Wolfram language, which is uh, sort of the, the, what has evolved from our Mathematica system that uh, we released actually 30 years ago, 30 years and one month ago, roughly. Um, so OK, so, so what is Wolfram language? How does it work? Well, let's just start off um, with something trivial. OK, we, we type into this notebook, 2 plus 2, we get 4, great. 
um, we type in, I don't know, we can, um, uh, we can, that is probably telling me that, um, what is that telling me? That's telling me that, um, okay, I set this to show me Portuguese uh, uh, code captions, which I can't understand, but maybe you can. So, um, the, uh, so here, just, just to start off doing computing something, uh, let's generate a random graph here. Um, and we can, for example, I don't know, we can do, uh, we could do some computation on that graph. We just take the graph itself and we start computing with it. Kind of the idea of our language is to be able to compute with any, uh, any kind of, um, of data. So another thing we could do, let's just take, um, for example, we can take an image here. There we go. So now we can, we can take that image and we could, for example, I don't know, we could say, um, uh, be an interesting thing to do. Well, let's just, let's just say, um, uh, well, we can, we can edge detect it. That's an easy thing. Um, so there's, there are the edges that it picked out in that image. Maybe what we can do just for fun, we can nestedly edge detect it. So we can take, a, uh, this, uh, this edge detection function and we can say, let's find the edges in the image and then the edges of the edges of the edges. Um, in that image. Um, maybe we could, uh, so the images are another kind of data that we can compute with. Um, something that, one of, one of the important things here is that we can deal with data about the real world, not just uh, data that uh, sort of uh, initiated in our computer. So for example, we might say, let's, let's just say something like this. Um, we can, the, the, the city of Rio de Janeiro is, a, is an entity in our system, so we can ask things about it. We could say, what's the geodistance from, um, well, actually, let's just say, what's the geodistance from Rio de Janeiro to, let's say, Boston? And um, it'll be able to compute the answer to that. Or, for example, I could say something like, Let, let's just take a, um, let's take some graphics. Let's start off, um, uh, let's take a disk that is centered on Rio de Janeiro, and let's, let's just say one mile diameter of the center of Rio de Janeiro. Now it's going to show us, um, hopefully, there we go. So there's, some, uh, there's a map of that. Maybe what we could do is make a table of maps that go out in kind of powers of 10 here. So we can say quantity uh, 10 to the n, uh, let's say kilometers, um, kilometers. Uh, and let's do that. N goes from zero to uh, five, let's say. Um, no, that's too big. Four. Um, so this now should show us a series of kind of powers of ten pictures going out from um, uh, from Rio de Janeiro out to um, uh, eventually. Eventually, we cover most of the world um, in this projection. The the um, the part we don't cover is kind of a weird shape. Um, we could um, so that that's some. Um, uh, so we can kind of go and um, we can compute about all kinds of things. Um, so if we want to do, um, uh, let, let's let's do a completely different kind of computation. Let's say we're interested in, um, uh, let's say we're interested in in something about painters. So we would know about, let's say Vincent Van Gogh. We would know about notable artworks of Van Gogh, and we'll probably get a big list of of things here. Let's say we get, um, let's just take the first five of those, for example. And let's then say we want to get um, uh, um, an image of each of those. Um, let's see whether we have these. Yeah, OK, there we go. And so for example, we might say, what, what is the, where in color space are the colors distributed for, for those particular images? OK, so, there's, so we see there's a bunch of blues there, a bunch of yellows, and so on. So we could take um, another thing we can do. Uh, that's um, uh, we could we could for example um, look at um, uh, we could do computations with uh, linguistic computations. The um, um, uh, so I think it's going to default yeah it's going to default to Portuguese here because my I told my computer that that, that was where where to go. Um, so for example I could say something like um, let's make a histogram of the lengths of words in Portuguese here. So there's a that's actually kind of surprisingly Gaussian. Now I'm curious whether, let's just see. I'm, I'm just, just pure curiosity here. Let's just say we have a function find distribution, which will try to figure out um, 
whether, uh, let's see, that was on line 15. Oops, line 15 here. Let's just see what, what distribution it thinks. I, I don't know what, um, uh, takes it a while to figure out what, um, um, it's, uh, okay. It's trying, it's trying to fit, it's trying to look through its sort of uh, library of possible statistical distributions to decide what, what distribution that likely is. Um, and it's having a hard time doing that, which is a sign that it's probably not a Gaussian distribution because that's an easy one for it to figure out. The, um, it's, um, actually, I have one possible idea of how to do this. Let me just try this. If it, if it thinks that they are numerical data, it might be able to do that faster. Um, in any case, so this is kind of a, a sketch of um, uh, of the kinds of things. All right, it's not it's not cooperating here. Um, Q Gaussian. Okay. The, let's see. We have a Q gamma. We don't have. Let's see. Well, let, let's look at. Okay. Let, let me see. Um, Normal distribution, okay, so let's say, um, uh, so we want some um, normal and related distributions. Which one is it? Uh, log normal, oh, there's a, this one here, okay. Okay, that's uh, the, um, nice, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we have this. The, um, Let's see. So what I want to do is, um, uh, for that, I think I would have to do find, now you're asking me, given that I know the distribution. So find distribution tries to work out what, uh, if I don't know the distribution, what, um, uh, what distribution might it be? So here, um, let's just take, um, let's just take this thing and um, let's see, that's got three parameters. And maybe what I can try to do is to say uh, what I'm looking for is um, something that will find given, um, okay, parametric distributions. Um, what I want to do is to fit that distribution given that I know, um, okay, I think I'm not going to be able to do this instantly. There's, there's a way of finding the parameters of a distribution if you know what the distribution is. I mean, I can show you, just, just for fun, let me, let me show you um, some things you can do. So, for example, if I say x is distributed according to a normal distribution, then I could ask, for example, oops, distribution. Uh, so that, that's normal distribution. So I could say, what's the expectation value of, for example, x squared times 1 plus x, if x is distributed according to a normal distribution. So that will be, that will turn into, oh, that was really boring. Um, let's try. Okay. Okay. So let's see, data and distribution, right? When in doubt, look at the documentation. Find distribution parameters. Okay, there we go. All right, so that's so that's what we should be doing. All right, so what we'll do here is um, we'll take that thing there, which was the lengths of those strings, and actually, oops, 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 oops. They um, take the length of those strings and say, I want to distribute it, I want to do it according to this distribution. It seems like it had, oops, it's according to that distribution, it seems like it has three parameters, so let's just try typing those in, and let's see what happens. So, this should be trying to fit um, the, uh, did, I, did I do something crazy here? No. Hmm. Well, I'm confused by why this is taking it so long. Let me see. Uh, Let's just get, and then I'm going to stop, stop doing. I, this is always the, um, uh, the perhaps interesting but dangerous thing. Let's see how much data there is there. So there's 400,000 data points there. Okay, that's fine. 
Um, and now we're just trying to find the best fit to these parameters. It may, it may be a, a complicated space to search. And it may be that I have to give it some starting values for it to, to happen quickly. Let's, let's, okay, let, let's, let's, um, let's look at something else, which is kind of like the modern version of fitting distributions, which is, if I, um, which is to do machine learning of various kinds. So for example, I could, let, let's just get, let's just do a web image search for something, I don't know, um, uh, elephants, let's say. And we're gonna get now, so now this is going out to the web, for, for all of the data that we've got, we're not going to the web. We, we, that's all curated data. But for something like this, we're just saying search the web for pictures. OK, let's say that's a picture there. Let's now say, can we identify what is that an image of? So we say image identify that. And hopefully, it will come back and say, if we're lucky, come on, OK. It says it's an African bush elephant. I don't know. It looks like an elephant to me, so that's a good start. Um, but uh, so you might want to know how is that computation actually done, and um, we can uh, we can actually look at the neural net that's inside that image identifier. So this is this is a neural net. Um, we can drill down and look at all the details of this neural net, um, and we can actually, if we want to, we can kind of look at this um, this neural net. Will it, it, it actually picks its its answers slightly differently from the way that? Um, okay, so it still says it's an African bush elephant. Let's say we just look at uh, the first 10 layers of that neural net. Um, now we'll be able to sort of see inside what the neural net is doing. Um, if we, uh, um, that, that's sort of looking in the, inside the kind of mind of the neural net at what the different ways it's processed that elephant picture are. And maybe we could say, let's do a feature space plot. So let's try to make some analysis of what's happening with those images. So this will now distribute those images in feature space um, if, if, for example, just to understand what this is doing, if we just take the alphabet, for instance, um, and we just take images of the alphabet, and then we make a feature space plot of that, um, that's going to show us uh, letters that are structurally similar will be close in feature space. So H and N are close in feature space. And that's kind of the foundation for how um, uh, uh, machine learning system works, is it's kind of looking um, at, for the, for the elephant picture, what what cluster of, of uh, what, what cluster of pictures is closest in feature space to the one that we fed in? So you know we can we can do we have a very elaborate system for machine learning, and the um, the uh, and um, actually one thing we just recently introduced was our neural net repository. We've been sort of uh, taking into our symbolic framework for neural nets. Um, we've been um, uh, ingesting kind of the latest research neural nets and, and building a bunch of neural nets of our own um, that um, do all kinds of different things. And each, each of these is, is um, uh, immediately usable in our, um, in our system. So for example, let's, let's take this network. This is a classic uh, kind of uh, one of the original neural nets that people studied. So we can say this is, well here, let's, let's just take the, the pure Lynette network. And let's say, um, I think we have that. Let's see. The, um, uh, okay. So this is a very small network, just an 11 layer network. We can just say, let's take the uninitialized evaluation network for that. Um, and we can start trying to use that. So, so for example, let, let me show you. This, this is a typical example of, um, uh, it's a typical neural net training set. Um, that um, uh, people use of, of handwritten digits. So here, uh, so there are, there, are the, there are the handwritten digits. Um, and now I could say, for example, let, let's take a random sample of, um, uh, of those digits. Let's take, let's say, 2,000 of those digits. And now let's go ahead and say we want to train this, this uh, neural net here, this little neural net. Uh, it was on line 36. So we just say, uh, there's lots of digits there. Um, net train, the neural net that we had on line 36 with the, this stuff here. So what you'll see here is it will now be doing the training of this neural net. So it's effectively doing solving an optimization problem to work out what the optimal choice of weights is for the neural net so that it will be able to recognize those handwritten digits. So it's, it's, um, it's taking it a little while here. Actually, we can stop it and just see how far it's got. It, it's, um, Okay, let's just stop it. We'll get a network here. We can take that network, and now we can use it 
on some digit here, and it should do a reasonable job of recognizing that that's an eight. So this was kind of the whole cycle that we needed to do to give it a bunch of examples to train the neural net to get a result. So, okay. So this is kind of an outline of, of uh, what we've tried to do with, with Wolfram Language. We've, we've, um, uh, we've ended up building, over the course of the last 32 years, uh, there are now about 6,000 kind of built-in functions in the language that cover all sorts of different areas. Um, if people are interested, I'm happy to, to talk about all sorts of different things here. But let me, let me try and give you the sort of broader context of what, um, uh, what I've been trying to do and, and then relate it to some physics and so on. So, in a sense, the, uh, um, the, the way that um, wh when one thinks about building a computer language, the basic idea is you think about sort of all the computations people might want to do, and then you do something that's a little bit like what you do in physics, which is you say, let's kind of drill down to find what are the ingredients, what are the, uh, the fundamental constituents, the primitives, from which you can build up all these computations that people want to do. And once you've sort of found that, um, those become the primitives in your language. Those become the different functions that we define in the language. But um, uh, this kind of process of, uh, of understanding, um, and, and so that's sort of the, at, at a practical level uh, what one does. So a long time ago, I was interested in, in um, uh, lots of kinds of science. And one of the things that I wanted to figure out was kind of what, what, are, what are the most general kinds of models that you can make in, in science. And people have been traditionally using uh, typically differential equations, things like that, to make models of sort of every possible thing. And I got interested in, in there are plenty of things in the world that are not well modeled by differential equations. And the question is, what else can one use as sort of a foundational model for things in science? And so that, that what I realized is that sort of you can use arbitrary sets of rules that can be embodied in computer programs. And so that got me into the whole adventure of trying to understand um, what the uh, uh, what computer programs, uh, what 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 the sort of universe of possible computer programs really does. And so you know the typical program that one writes for some particular purpose is some long program that has uh, um, that has lots of lots of uh, of detailed uh, details inside it. But what I was interested in was sort of a basic science question. If you just look at the universe of all possible programs, what do they typically do? And so my, my favorite kind of programs, because uh, they're really simple and they're really visual, are cellular automata. And so a typical cellular automaton, let me just make one here. Um, so this is a typical rule for a cellular automaton. It's a, they're just a line of black and white cells. And at each step, the, um, uh, the color of each cell is determined by the colors of the cells above it, according to this rule. Okay, so so this is um, uh, so we can ask, well, what what does this? Um, if we just run this rule, starting let's say from some simple initial condition, um, what does it do? And uh, I don't know. Let's go 30 steps or something. Let's make put a mesh on it. Um, so, oops. Just do that. The uh, Crazy. What's happening here? Oh, very silly. The um, uh, so okay with this particular rule, it just says whenever there's a black cell in the neighborhood, uh, make the um, uh, make the next cell black as well. So okay, so the question is, what happens if you try different rules? So let's try a slightly different rule. Here's, here's a rule where where they just change one bit in the rule, and we get this pattern here. And at this point, we might be thinking, OK, if the rule is simple enough, the behavior of the, uh, the, according to that rule is going to be somehow correspondingly simple. Well, let's change the rules some more. We get something like, like this. Um, now, if we run it, we'll get something which is a little bit more complicated. Let's get rid of the mesh here and run it for a few more steps. And we'll see that with this particular rule, we get some nested fractal pattern. So then the obvious question is, well, what, what possible patterns do you get with all possible rules? So that's an easy experiment to do in modern times. Um, so I can just say for every rule here, n, just make a table of what I get for all these different, um, all these different rules. Uh, let's say 0 to 63. So, so here what's happening is every one of these pictures corresponds to a different rule. We're always starting off from just one black cell. 
And um, uh, for many of these rules, the behavior is very simple. There we see a nested one. Um, my sort of all-time favorite science discovery is what happens when you get to rule 30 here. Um, you get a pattern that doesn't look obviously simple. So you might say, well, the rule for rule 30, let's look at that rule. It's something very simple. Um, the question is, um, what uh, you might say, well, if I run it long enough, somehow it will must resolve into something simple. But it doesn't. Um, and you can see there's a certain amount of regularity over on the left. But for many practical purposes, the behavior, uh, according to Rule 30, seems completely random. Like, for example, the center column of cells here is sufficiently random that we used it as the random number generator in Wolfram language for about 25 years. Um, it's uh, recent, recently retired because we found a more efficient one based on another kind of cellular automaton. But um, uh, so this is, as far as I'm concerned, it's sort of a, a surprising fact that a rule that simple can make behavior that complicated. It's something which is different from our usual intuition that we get from, you know, for example, doing engineering, where we want to make something complicated, we typically have to put something complicated in. And I think this is important for understanding lots of kinds of phenomena in nature, um, and we can talk about a bunch of those. But um, maybe from a theoretical point of view, what's perhaps of interest is um, you can ask questions like, how do you predict what's going to happen in Rule 30? Well, it's pretty straightforward to run the rule and just see what happens after some number of steps. But can we kind of jump ahead? Can we find sort of an exact solution to what's going to happen? The answer is I don't think so. I think there's a phenomenon I call computational irreducibility that basically says if you want to find out what's going to happen in this rule, you pretty much just have to run it and see what happens. There's no way to kind of jump ahead and get a kind of closed form solution. And that has, that has all sorts of implications in, in all kinds of areas. Let's, let's ask, um, let's, let's look at another example here. Let's, um, let's say we, uh, um, well, here, let's just look at this. Um, so here's an example of, um, um, This is just another cellular automaton rule, this time started from random initial conditions. And um, uh, let's see if I can get it to not alias as badly on the screen. Well, OK. You can probably see there, uh, roughly, there are some sort of particle-like excitations, particle-like uh, structures. Let's run it a bit longer, see whether it looks a bit better. There we go. Um, OK, so, this, so starting off just from a random initial condition, um, this is an irreversible rule, so it, it sort of settles down into something um, that in this particular case has these various structures. You can kind of build a whole particle physics of these structures. There are a fixed set of particles. You can look at the interactions between these particles. Um, you, can, you can study all kinds of things about them. One thing that you can do is to ask uh, how sophisticated is the computation that this particular cellular automaton is doing. And with considerable effort, it's possible to show that by using all those particles and things, you can actually make this cellular automaton emulate any computational system. So you can make it emulate a Turing machine or, or anything else. Um, and so you therefore know that this cellular automaton is a universal computer. And there's a, there's a kind of thing I call principle of computational equivalence, which sort of talks about what the level of computational sophistication of different systems is. You might have thought that as you progressively increase the complexity of the rules in a system, the computational ability of that system will get sort of progressively uh, higher. But in fact, the, um, uh, what this principle of computational equivalence says is that you jump from having a sort of low, comp the, 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 uh, when you get above some level of sophistication of the rules, and that level is very simple, you immediately jump to systems that are sort of as sophisticated as anything. And that's kind of why you have computational irreducibility, because principle of computational equivalence says that, that whatever kind of system you have, it will, uh, it will always have sort of the same level of computational sophistication, whether it's our brain kind of trying to work out what happens, or our mathematics trying to work out what happens in the evolution of the system, or the system itself. And the fact that those are sort of on the same level of computational sophistication is what leads to this, this phenomenon of computational irreducibility that you kind of can't jump ahead in, in seeing the results. So anyway, the, um, uh, well, there's, you know, I can talk a bit about uh, maybe a sort of side comment about physics, okay? 
So once you've seen that you can start off with these extremely simple rules and get very elaborate behavior, the obvious question is, OK, so what about fundamental physics? Uh, we, uh, wh what, how much of physics can we reproduce from extremely simple underlying rules? And kind of the, the history of physics, you know, the big picture of the history of physics is that we're close to one century since the uh, sort of beginnings of the main current paradigms for fundamental physics, namely general relativity and quantum field theory. And those have taken us a long way, but they have not actually delivered a truly fundamental theory of physics. And so the question is, if we start thinking in terms of programs rather than in terms of, of uh, sort of traditional mathematical structures, um, can we make progress in understanding a, a truly fundamental theory of physics? And um, I'm quite optimistic about this possibility, but the thing you have to start realizing is that if indeed there's sort of a program that represents uh, the universe, so to speak, and that program is simple, then you don't get to put in sort of the, 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 every, the, the known features of physics into that program. Because you've got a program that's like three lines of Wolfram language code long. You don't get to put in you know, the, the electron muon mass ratio. Or you don't even probably get to put in the three for the number of dimensions of space. All of those things have to emerge from the large-scale behavior of the system. So I've been interested in kind of what the underlying stuff from which you can make uh, physics might be. And my kind of favorite um, uh, system to look at is, let's see if I can find the right thing. Um, yeah, there we go. My favorite um, kind of uh, thing to look at as sort of something that exists underneath space and time is just some kind of network. This is, a, this is just a particular network um, rendered in three dimensions. But the idea is that the only information you have is connectivity data about the network. And just like in, let's say, fluid dynamics, you get sort of the effective continuum behavior of a fluid from looking at the large scale structure, um, uh, even though there are a bunch of discrete molecules underneath. The idea here is that the structure of space as a manifold emerges from the large scale behavior of something like this kind of network. And um, the, uh, let's see, how do I get out of here? Um, yeah. So then the question is, how, how does that network, um, for example, how might you update that network? So this is, um, so you, much like a cellular automaton, you can imagine just using uh, rewrite rules on the network saying that a particular subgraph of that network um, in, um, uh, uh, will get kind of rewritten um, to a different subgraph if it ever occurs. And so for some, sub, for some network rewrite rules, the universe is kind of trivial. It doesn't evolve at all. But there exist, even among very simple network rewrite rules, there exist examples where you end up getting these really complicated structures. And sometimes you can see that these structures have limits that correspond to manifolds and so on. Uh, there are a few, uh, the, the question of, you know, the, can, might we already have found an actual theory of physics among the, um, uh, the possible rules that we've searched through? The answer is we can't exclude that because as a result of computational irreducibility, it's hard to figure out what the ultimate behavior of these systems is. But some things you can figure out. And so, for example, one nice result of many years ago now um, that uh, I got is, is um, to ask, if you, if you look at this network and you ask kind of what manifold does it limit to, then uh, with certain conditions on the rewrite rules, a rather large class of rewrite rules have the property that um, uh, essentially in, it's a derivation similar to the derivation of fluid dynamics from molecular dynamics. You can make a derivation of what the structure of space-time is from this underlying discrete dynamics. And it turns out very nicely that you get, uh, subject to various conditions, you can derive the Einstein equations, uh, initially the vacuum Einstein equations, and then, uh, the, well, let me explain what happens then. But, but um, you can derive that the large-scale manifold that comes from these networks must satisfy the Einstein equations, which is kind of non-trivial because it's very, there really aren't other examples where we can derive general relativity from uh, underlying uh, something underneath sort of space and time. 
the, um, the way this, this system has to work is there's sort of nothing in the universe other than space. Um, and so, for example, particles have to emerge much like they do in that, um, uh, in that rule 110 solid automaton. They have to emerge just as a result of structure um, in, in, the, in the evolution of the network. And one can see some simple examples of that. We haven't um, been able to get things that are uh, sort of reproduce the standard model or anything exciting like that. But we can at least see some toy examples um, where you get particle-like uh, behavior, um, and even where that particle-like behavior has certain quantum-like features, which which um, is 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 rather interesting. But but so the the, um, the 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 possibility there is that sort of from this um, from this underlying uh, very simple uh, program, we can potentially get something which reproduces uh, uh, the physics that we know. Well, in general sort of what's the, the big picture of what's going on there. The way I think about it is there's this kind of computational universe of possible programs out there. And the, one of the questions is, is our physical universe out there among these possible programs in the, in the computational universe of sort of all possible universes? So that's a kind of physics question. There's also uh, other places where you can make use of sort of the, what's out there in the computational universe. One of the important ones is technology. Um, the question is, can we sort of mine this computational universe of possible programs for programs that are useful for particular purposes? So, for example, the Rule 30 cellular automaton is useful as a random number generator. There are lots of other things that one can find in this computational universe of simple programs that are useful for different purposes. And, in fact, when we built Wolfram Alpha, uh, we use those a lot. We kind of do searches in these large spaces of possible programs to find ones that are useful for particular purposes. But this also relates to kind of the bigger picture of what is one trying to do um, in computation. So the way I see it, there's this kind of computational universe of possible programs out there that can do all kinds of elaborate things. And the issue for us humans is to figure out which of those computations we care about, which of those computations do we, do we want to have our computers doing. And so the, the, the challenge is to kind of make some bridge between the things that we think about wanting to do and what's actually possible to do in the computational universe. And I, I guess I see my efforts with Wolfram Language as being an, an attempt to make that bridge between us, the way we want to think about doing things, and what's possible in the computational universe. And so the idea is, in Wolfram Language, to, to capture as much as possible of kind of the knowledge and the kind of computational thinking that we as humans um, want to do, and then be able to automatically get those things executed um, by the computer. And so that's a, you know, we've, we've been, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the sort of the, the, the challenge there is traditional computer languages have really uh, pandered to the details of how computers work. They, they give you operations that are very close to the underlying operation of the computer. What we're trying to do with, with Wolfram Language is to provide this kind of layer of computational intelligence that includes uh, lots of knowledge about the world. So, you know, I've showed you various domains of knowledge. We can, we can look at all kinds of other things. I mean, I don't know. We can look at, um, uh, let's say, um, I realized we... we um, I was looking for the Sugarloaf Mountain, and I discovered that actually, if you type in Sugarloaf, it'll default to assume that that's a food. Um, so we can uh, uh, we can say, oh, it won't do that. Hold on, that's um, oh, it probably needs some more specificity in the anyway. So it it um, uh, it's um, that that will so we have all sorts of data on hundreds of thousands of foods. I think if we actually say Sugarloaf Mountain, we might get your local mountain. Um, let's see if it's the right one. Um, oh boy, there's all kinds of different. Uh, no, this is not the right Sugarloaf Mountain. Uh, there are. Uh, um, I think. Uh, um, actually, I was doing this earlier, trying to trying to get your Sugarloaf Mountain. Let's see whether. Um, let's try. You know, this is this is. Um, this is kind of what. Uh, what it looks like to compute about things in the real world. So I just asked it, what are the, what are the nearest mountains to Rio de Janeiro? There's that mountain. So for example, if I want to, I could just say, um, uh, could say here, let's get the, um, 
uh, geo-elevation data for something which is around that mountain. Let's say it's a, a one-mile diameter around that mountain. So this should be able to get, um, let's see whether we can get that, okay. Um, so this should make, there we go, oh, whoops, we need to tell it that it wants, whoops, we need to tell it to show the whole, whole height of the mountain. Um, so, there we go. So there's, there's that, um, there's that mountain. And it's kind of, you know, what to me is important is that we can just do computations with things like this. We, 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 um, you know, we can immediately, you know, we can have sort of a, a, um, uh, an environment where we can just take for granted that data like this exists. Like, for example, if you, um, uh, I don't know, we could take, um, let's take a, um, let's see, I'm curious here. Um, take some random war, and we should have um, data. Okay, it's a military conflict. Let's try battles. Um, so this is, again, just something where we have data on this. So maybe we can make a timeline um, of that particular uh, War up. Oh, what happened there? What did I tell it to do? Let's see whether we can show where those battles were. Um, so okay. So that's so that's for example the distribution of battles in the Mexican-American War, which I never asked about before. But but um, um, the uh, so again, you know, having having the ability to just compute with all these different kinds of things. Is, is sort of an interesting opportunity for science. It's an interesting opportunity. You know, I, I see the um, uh, kind of the, one of the, the, the phenomena that's happening in science is, you know, for every field X, from kind of archaeology to zoology, there either is now a computational X or there soon will be. And one of the things we're trying to do with Wolfram Language is to provide kind of the, the, the raw material to make computational X possible for, for all X, so to speak. Now I can I can mention I'm not sure if people are interested in this but but um, I can mention there's all kinds of practicalities about um, uh, doing um, let's say uh, um, um, let's try this all, all kinds of practicalities about how one actually uses um, the language I mean let, let's say we're making um, let's make a simple uh, some simple uh, uh, interactive thing here let's say um, Let's do that. We can see sort of beat frequencies probably here. Um, well, let's take this and let's say we want to publish that to the cloud. So we can just say cloud publish that, and we should get this link to something uh, in the cloud that will ex implement that same computation. So this is now just in a web browser. Um, it'll take a little bit longer to run because it has to go back and forth to a server, but there's the, there's the same result. And we can take this kind of... Um, uh, this notebook that we've been creating here, and we can publish that notebook to the cloud. Um, so we can, for example, add things here, say, you know, interactive thing or whatever. Um, we, can, we can annotate this. We can kind of build a whole computational essay. It thinks we're dealing with Portuguese here, so it thinks that's a spelling mistake. But so it goes. Um, but uh, anyway, we, we can kind of add... Uh, I, you know, I see this as kind of the future of scientific communication is what one might call computational essays, um, where one is describing in kind of human language ideas, but then one is also using code to actually express those ideas in a precise fashion. And kind of the, the goal here is to have Wolfram language be something that acts as a sort of whole computational communication language between us and computers, something that both the computer can understand and we can understand, um, and we can actually read the code, so to speak, just like we can read a formula in mathematical notation, we can read the code to have a precise understanding of what's going on. So, so that's kind of the, the, the objective. Now, you know, I can, I can talk about, um, uh, I, I see this as being kind of um, uh, our computational communication language that we're building as being sort of an important link to the sort of future world of increasing automation and increasing AI. 
Um, there are all kinds of interesting things one can do when one has a language like ours that can express things in the real world. So, for example, one direction is creating computational contracts. You know, when people make contracts between each other, they'll have to right now write that contract in human language, you know, maybe in English or in, or in Portuguese or something, or maybe in legalese, which is an attempt to make a slightly more precise version of representing what's going on. But sort of the future, I think, is being able to express contracts computationally. And one of the things we're trying to do with Wolfram Language is to make it express enough things about the world that you can talk about the kinds of things that you might see in a contract, for instance. And that's also relevant uh, if you want to deal with things like blockchains. Um, you can, uh, well, here, for example, I can just say, uh, let's, let's just take, um, uh, here, I can, I can just look at, um, we can certainly uh, use blockchains as a source of data. So this is the most recent block that just got mined on the Ethereum blockchain, and we can go and do analysis of this and so on. But we can also use this uh, Wolfram language as a way of writing computational contracts that can be, for example, secured or executed on blockchains and so on. So that's, um, that's kind of a... a, a, a um, and, and when we think about sort of AIs, and we think about, for example, Questions like, how should we tell the AIs what we want them to do? Um, how should we give AIs you know, ethics, for example? Well, I think the basic answer is that you end up with something like a computational contract that you have to uh, specify as a way to kind of describe how an AI should interact with the world. Well, lots of other things I could talk about. I'll show you one other thing that you might find interesting. So this is um, uh, in a quite different uh, direction. This is about, uh, actually, it's related. Um, this is, um, let me just find one thing here so I can um, show you something. Uh, gosh, where is it? Um, uh, I am looking for, that's terrible. I should have be able to find this instantly, but um, there we go. Okay. So, um, so I was interested in, th this is a question about pure mathematics. So um, the, um, the question is, uh, you know, mathematics as it's been practiced operates according to certain axiom systems, like the Peano axioms for arithmetic or Euclid's axioms for geometry, those kinds of things. But if you're in the business of trying to understand kind of the, the computational universe of all possible programs, you get to ask the question, well, what does the space of all possible mathematics look like? Um, so you just start enumerating possible axiom systems and, and ask uh, what, what, what they mean, what they do. You know, people might say, well, we have the mathematics we have today because it's what's useful in understanding, for example, the physical world. But one of the things that I sort of realized is that actually there are other kinds of programs that aren't what are represented in, in current mathematics that are useful for understanding the physical world. So there's no reason why we should just stick with those particular axiom systems that we've kind of historically used in mathematics. So one of the questions that comes up there is, OK, what? Um, uh, so if you look for existing theories, of, uh, existing areas of mathematics, like logic, for example, where does logic lie in the space of all possible axiom systems? So about 20 years ago now, I, I did a big search for that. And what I found is that this particular, um, let's just make this slightly more beautiful looking. Um, so that particular axiom system is actually the very simplest possible axiom system for logic. Um, so it's interesting that you know, in the space of all possible axiom systems, logic is not absolutely tiny, but it's not very big either. It's about the 50,000th axiom system that you get to if you just start enumerating axiom systems. Anyway, one of the things that's sort of interesting today is that we can um, go ahead and uh, uh, actually generate proofs, for example, of um, uh, um, uh, about this axiom system. So for example, we can say, let's try and prove commutativity of what amounts to the NAND operation um, given, um, uh, given that axiom system. And now this might take a little while. But um, uh, what's interesting here, OK, there we go. So this is a. Um, uh, so this is now, uh, let's say, um, yeah, there we go. So this is, this is the proof 
of the commutativity of NAND according to this axiom system. And it has 102 steps. And the main takeaway of this is it's absolutely incomprehensible. Um, you, can, you can kind of draw a, um, if you look here, um, you, can, you can kind of draw a, a network that shows kind of what the relations are between um, different, uh, oops, I want to say, um, maybe it's proof graph. Um, let's go back there. Yeah, there we go. So that just represents the kind of structure of the proof in terms of how um, the different lemmas and the proof relate to each other. OK, so the, the main takeaway from this is it's basically incomprehensible to humans. And so the question is, uh, you know, what that, what that tells us about kind of the future of, for example, science. So this is something where, you know, we have a proof. We can validate that every step works. But we can't actually give an explainable version of that proof. Why not? Well, what we need is, is to form certain concepts um, that um, w if we could figure out what the right new concepts were, we could probably build up this proof from a whole uh, hierarchy of concepts. I mean, it's like in natural language, um, we end up, when there are concepts that we commonly encounter, we end up with words for them. Like, for example, you know, probably in the Stone Age, there wasn't a word for table. But once people had seen a bunch of things that were like tables, it was worthwhile to introduce a word for table, and we could then build up from there. And one of the things that's interesting in, in um, sort of the modern world of neural nets and AI and so on is that inside these neural nets, they're effectively discovering things about the world, but there aren't sort of human-related words for the things they've discovered. They're just things that, are, that happen inside those neural networks. And so it's sort of the same issue with, uh, uh, with dealing with the automation of mathematical proof and with thinking about kind of um, how do we understand what AIs are doing inside. It's also related to many areas of science where we're asking, is there a way of sort of explaining what's going on in the science or are we kind of thrown into the, a world of computational irreducibility where basically we can only just simulate what happens? So these are things that um, uh, this, this whole sort of question of sort of how you form concepts uh, in a sense, it relates directly to what I've spent a large part of my life doing, which is the, the structure of, of something like Wolfram Language is all about kind of trying to identify what the right concepts to capture the kinds of things that we want to do and that we think about in the world are. So anyway, that, that um, uh, and you know, from, a, from a practical point of view right now, what I'm trying to do is to provide sort of this, this layer of computational intelligence that people can take for granted when they use computers. I mean, if you look at the kind of the long history of, co of computer usage, it's about 60 years now that computers have been, been used, they're, you know, at the very beginning, they were just raw computers. And if you wanted to program them, you would use machine code or whatever else. Then there started to be sort of the early computer languages, um, Fortran, COBOL, things like that. And then progressively, there were more layers of, of sort of uh, capability that people took for granted. There were early operating systems, then user interfaces, networking, things like this. Um, what we're trying to do now is to provide this kind of ubiquitous layer of computational intelligence where you can just assume that when you walk up to a computer, um, it knows about you know, battles in some war. It knows about the geo-elevation data of the local mountain uh, or whatever else. That's kind of the... Um, uh, the objective that we have from a practical point of view, and that uh, enables lots of, uh, I think, lots of very interesting progress in lots of different areas of science where we're really bringing this kind of computational paradigm um, to, these, to these areas of science. I should probably stop here, and I'm really happy to, to try and answer questions, have discussion, and so on. I can talk in much more detail about physics, but I don't know what fraction of people here are, are, are fully physics-oriented. Um, but let me, let me stop there. Thank you. So we have time for two questions. And you should tell us when we should feel because he has to be in another place uh, soon. So the more questions, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, who, who would like to start? I have one. Yes. During 2000 years, uh, mathematicians and geometricians 
We are trying to understand whether the fifth postulate of Euclid was necessary or not, or whether it was a theorem of all the others. Right. With this kind of thing, you could answer that question very quickly. Is that if correct? You have, if you have the axioms encoded properly, yes, you can answer that question quickly. I mean, you, the, of, um, in fact, we happen to have been working on geometry recently and on being able to, uh, okay, we have a very practical reason for this, which is people use Wolfram Alpha to do all kinds of, of high school math, and one of the areas of high school math is geometry. And it's sort of, uh, and we want them to be able to just basically take the question from the geometry book, type it in, and have us automatically be able to resolve it. So actually, that would be an interesting exercise to take to, because we will have the encoding. Uh, we actually, actually, one could even do this. Actually, even in the big book I wrote, we have, um, uh, I have a, an encoding of, um, uh, let's take a look just for one second here. Um, Okay, let me see. This is in um, here we go. So I'm pretty sure. Oh boy, this this display is is narrow enough that it's not showing me the the image version of this because it's um because it thinks that the um it thinks I won't be able to see it. Um, let's just see. Oh, there we go. Okay. So this is um uh so these are actually let's see on the next page probably um. Okay, so I think I have here, yeah, there we go. So those are the axioms of Euclidean geometry written out in kind of formal form. And actually, that would be a really good exercise, and we should try it. Just put these in. I, I probably can't do it right now, but um, to just put these in and see, see what, the, um, uh, you know, what you can prove from what. Because um, we should be able to do it. Our, our theorem proving system should just be able to grind right through that. I should have done that already. Good idea, um, but uh, uh, you know, I, I would say one thing about Euclid's um, postulates and so on. One of the things I find interesting is that you know the the invalidity for the universe of Euclid's fifth postulate was sort of a big deal to realize. My guess is that Euclid's first common notion is wrong, and that that's actually the reason that uh, for certain kinds of progress in physics being hard to make. The first common notion is a point is indivisible, basically, that, which is essentially a statement of the continuity of space. And that's the, um, you know, uh, it's sort of an interesting irony of history, perhaps. If it turns out that that is wrong, then it will be sort of two postulates of Euclid that had to fall before you could actually make progress in, in, um, uh, in understanding things about fundamental physics. But, yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Stephen. Um, I think um, a comment Euler and Ramanujan would would adore your system. God knows the, how much math they would have discovered with this as an aid. But I have a question about the future. Uh, do you envision a future in which computational intelligence is just incompreh incomprehensible to humans? Or do you envision augmented humans that uh, somehow... Right. So that's a good question. I mean, I think that you know, one of my beliefs about computation is that it's very ubiquitous. I mean, that is that, you know, we know one example of intelligence, which is human intelligence, but the, you know, there's all over the universe, there's computation that is as sophisticated as the computation that's going on in human intelligence. And so, you know, kind of the, the common statement, you know, the weather has a mind of its own is, um, you know, what does that mean? Well, if you believe in this principle of computational equivalence, then one of the implications is that the hydrodynamics of the atmosphere is as computationally sophisticated as our brains. The only problem is that the, the computations that are going on in the weather aren't connected to human purposes and human, uh, you know, human thinking about goals of what you're trying to do. So in other words, there's computation that's going on, but it is not human-like computation. And so you know, I think that this idea that there's sophisticated computation, but it isn't human-like, is, is quite ubiquitous. I mean, you know, when you think about extraterrestrial intelligence, um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the things I suspect is that, you know, you look at, I don't know, a pulsar or something, and it's got some magnetosphere with all kinds of complicated structure, and you say, well, that's not intelligent, that's just a pulsar magnetosphere op operating according to physics. Well, of course, our brains also operate according to physics. And the question is, is there a real distinction between the computations that are going on in that pulsar magnetosphere producing this weird sequence of pulses um, versus the things that go on in our brains? And I think the, um, 
uh, the thing that, um, well, okay, so here's my guess about how this is going to play out. Um, people, right now, we have only one example of intelligence that we really believe in, which is human intelligence. We are in the process of building a pretty convincing second example of intelligence, which is AI. And AI is, in a sense, our first example of alien intelligence. So, um, because the way it works is, you know, internally is apparently fairly different from the way our brains work, but it is close enough that we can kind of see that it is doing something intelligent-like. Now, so I think, you know, once we really understand sort of AI and get used to it, we will stop worrying about where extraterrestrial intelligence is because we'll realize that actually things like pulsar magnetospheres are perfectly good examples of extraterrestrial intelligence, just not human-aligned intelligence. So I think, but in, in terms of what will happen with, uh, with humans, I mean, I think the, um, the whole point is the computational universe is full of capability. The issue is which parts of it do we choose to make use of? And that depends on us, so to speak. So in other words, we have to express human goals in order to, you know, the, the computational universe is just going to go and do its thing, just as the weather goes and does its thing. The question is, can we connect what we as humans kind of think about to the things that can get done in the computational universe? And so then how does that relate to, uh, so, so in other words, people say, well, you know, all the jobs are going to go away because everything's going to get automated. But the one thing which is sort of by definition unautomatable is what do you want to do? Because that's, that's the thing that, um, you know, when you, you automate, you know, you, you can sort of, th that's the thing that even in principle, you know, it just doesn't sort of make philosophical sense to say that we can automate what it is we want to do. Because that's something that is, is the specific thing that has, you know, it's, there's no perfect answer to the what do you want to do. It's, it's something which has to emerge from kind of the detailed history of our, you know, species, individuals, etc. So, look, as a practical matter, I think um, the, uh, uh, you know, we will see, you know, an increasing number of things in the world be able to be automated. My guess is that, you know, in not very long, you know, we'll have all kinds of, you know, nice, maybe augmented reality, maybe some other kind of display mechanism or communication mechanism which kind of tells us, okay, you know, I'm your, your pet AI and I've been ingesting your experience of the world and let me tell you, the right thing to do next is dot, dot, dot. Just like, you know, a GPS tells you that, you know, the next turn to make is dot, dot, dot. And my guess is that basically people will just follow what the AI tells them to do most of the time. And um, that's sort of a, a um, and th then, you know, there's the question of kind of what, um, well, so, so, you know, in that sense, the AIs will take over because most humans, most of the time, will do what the AIs tell them to do, which is kind of a, you know, with, with but then the, the bigger question of, I mean, the, the, there are all kinds of questions that one can um, talk about that get quite sort of philosophical about the future of, of um, uh, kind of the human condition versus AI and so on. I think the, um, you know, the scenario, the, the kind of, the bad scenario for the future of history is, you know, in the end, it's a, it's a trillion disembodied souls in some box that, um, you know, where we've got a bunch of uploaded human consciousnesses sitting in some box. And, you know, the bad case is playing video games for the rest of eternity type thing. Um, but, you know, the thing that to realize is that the, um, uh, the thing that makes that seem less bad is to understand how human purpose has evolved over the course of history. Because you go back even a thousand years and you were to describe to somebody from a thousand years ago the things that we do today, many of the things we do today would be, seem bizarrely pointless. Um, and so I think it, you know, in, within, in, you know, when you're sort of living inside one of these systems, the, this question of whether you are achieving things with purpose, um, uh, for example, or, you know, having... Um, is, is something that has a, you know, it works in a somewhat different way. And so I think it's a, you know, even though from us today it may look like, okay, there's a trillion souls playing video games for the rest of eternity, um, to those souls, the experience may be very different. So anyway, there are many things to say about this. But, yeah. Is, is the machine starting to tell us what we should want? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the things that, that, you know, in a sense, you know, humans set the overall goals. 
the details of how to get there, we are increasingly able to automate. And it's increasing, even when there's a human in the loop, even when the things we're trying to achieve involve us doing something. Um, yes, I mean, that's, 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 but, you know, the, the fact is, that's not really a new phenomenon. I mean, in the sense that if we look at sort of the history of civilization, sort of the, the, you know, we could just say, well, people are just out on their own figuring out what they should do for themselves. But actually, you know, civilization has provided us a lot of information about, you know, what we should do that is kind of central information that, that um, and it's in this very much the same way that AI provides us sort of centralized information about what we should do. So it's not, it's not something shockingly new. It's just a development of what has been happening for thousands of years. We have just one or two other questions. Yeah. My pleasure. So we all know about the uh, Turing test. Um, in uh, this development that uh, you are uh, getting to some uh, natural language, have you ever tried to think, uh, teach uh, this uh, automatic intelligence to uh, write some reasonable scientific uh, paper which can pass the, the test of being accepted in some uh, peer review journal? How far we are from that? Um, okay, so, so first, uh, if you don't look too closely, we're very close to that. If you look, in other words, let me give you an example. So um, this is a, uh, um, this is a website we made a decade ago, actually, now, which um, uh, composes music using, um, let's try, no. oops. It's not a very good one. I don't like that one. Let's try another one. That looks really boring. Um, okay, let's try that. Okay, try another one. These always, when, anyway, the, the point of this, stop it. The point of this is this is this is just going out, this particular thing is just going out into the computational universe of possible cellular automata using various criteria to decide what correspond to plausible uh, kind of sources for different styles of music, bringing them back. It's kind of, this is sort of uh, a kind of automated creativity that um, uh, that's being used there. When it comes to doing something like making a scientific paper, the um, uh, the kind of the cheap way to do it is to train a machine learning system to just um, be able to generate things with the right, in a sense, statistics to be a scientific paper. That's the, that's the, that's the kind of cheap way to do it. And that we can pretty much do now. I, I mean, we haven't tried doing that particular thing, but we can certainly generate plausible, uh, you know, plausible pieces of English and so on. The, um, uh, the question of whether, um, you know, what does it mean to um, uh, to generate sort of it depends what you want from your scientific paper. If you want kind of incremental progress on something, I think we can do a pretty good job. I mean, if, if you say, okay, if your if your scientific paper is going to be about some particular piece of data, um, well, you know, you can drop that data into our cloud, and then we have very automated methods for telling you here are some interesting things about that data, basically generating a report about that data. The way it will look is a bit more, I mean, one could write it out in words, like in a scientific paper, but you know, typical Wolfram Alpha output is kind of a structured report about, for example, a piece of data. And that's something we can, you know, we can do now and be very useful doing. And in fact, it's a, it's a way that people are doing data science with our technology stack um, all over the place right now. Um, if you want a scientific paper that is, you know, inventing, I mean, it depends on the field. Um, you know, in, in, if it's a data-based thing, then the data science is quite automated at this point. If it's a, um, you know, invent a new theory for dark matter or something, that's, you know, that's kind of off the table for the time being, um, other than as a kind of a cheap trick of, of generating something with the right statistics. Uh, 
just allow one more question and oh, he will allow me to give one more question. Uh, hi, Stephen. I'd like to know what do you think are the biggest challenges for the NLP area, which I think it's like a basis for your product. For example, Wolf on Alpha, the user inputs a sequence of words and you try to emulate what he would, right. he or she would like to want from the, from the right. problem. So that's that's my question. How do you see the progress of that in the next years? Right. So, so there's really two different things. There's natural language processing and there's natural language understanding. We've been much more interested in natural language understanding. Um, natural language understanding had made very little progress for decades. Um, and the main reason, which I didn't really realize until after we had succeeded in making progress, is there's two critical things. First of all, what are you going to turn the natural language into? In other words, let's say you successfully understand a piece of natural language. How do you represent that understanding? You have to have a symbolic, a precise symbolic language that is the output of your natural language understanding system. And that's what we have in Wolfram Language. Um, and that's why we were able to make progress there. The second thing is, it turns out that actually understanding language depends on having lots of knowledge about the world. And that's, again, something people had not really internalized. I mean, they were thinking they could use some statistical technique or something, but that just doesn't, that doesn't do it because it doesn't give you knowledge about, it doesn't, you need knowledge about the world. Now, so, so in natural language understanding, We've been really quite successful there. So in the domains in Wolfram Alpha, for example, in the well-developed domains, we're getting to 97, 98% success rate in understanding what people are asking and being able to compute from it. There are even examples. There's a, there's a big project. Um, the biggest pharmacy chain in the US now uses our natural language understanding system to understand the prescriptions that doctors write. Um, so that's a case where they've actually, they claim, they've reached 100% success rate in either correctly understanding it or saying, forget it, we don't understand it. Um, but I think it's at about 95% success rate of, 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 of thinking that it understands it there. So I think that's natural language understanding as a result of having a symbolic language into which to put the results. Um, and the techniques that we've used for NLU are really very different from the traditional computational linguistics techniques, which um, not least because most of our input methods, uh, people don't actually produce kind of, um, they don't write full sentences and things. When they're typing stuff into Wolfram Alpha, when they're saying things to Siri, when they're saying things to you know, various intelligence assistants and so on, they say things in some very messy way. And so having a perfect parser for you know, perfect English sentences or Portuguese sentences or whatever doesn't really, doesn't really help you. Now, it's interesting that in, in, in standard natural language un, uh, processing, you know, we've, we've done a lot of things there. We have a, actually a new function called find textual answer. Um, I could probably get it if I, if I like, generate. Um, uh, let's say I give it the Wikipedia article on Brazil um, as, its, as its raw data. And this will now use kind of the latest, um, uh, let's see. How big is Brazil? Let's try asking that question. So this is now using much more traditional natural language. Actually, let me, let me ask this. Let me say, give me five answers to how big is Brazil. Um, so this is now trying to do use machine learning to uh, answer. OK, so that was actually a pretty good answer. Let's see what it does. OK, so here's, um, OK, so, so some of these answers we write, and some of them are nonsense. Right? And the problem is, we can get to probably 80% success rate with fine textual answer. Um, but which 20% are complete nonsense, we have no idea. And that's the, that's the problem of, of, of those kinds of techniques. Um, but this is, I mean, this is a fairly interesting, the, the way this works is using the very latest you know, recurrent neural network, <laughs> sequence to sequence transformation, this, that, and the other. So this is kind of the state of the art of what you can do with that. And, and it doesn't really, it doesn't succeed. In fact, we wanted to use this to prime our curation pipeline because we do a lot of data curation trying to actually, you know, figure out what were all the battles in such and such a war or what were all the, you know, names by which some company is known and so on. And we, we were trying to use this to prime that. And it hasn't, so far it hasn't worked very well. So far we've, we've been better off just going back to original sources um, to, and having humans pick, pick out data 
than, than having this do it because, because, because of the problem of the sort of 20% that doesn't work. Just to finish before he gets angry at me, let me just make a, a final question. I mean, you, I mean, what characterizes is culture, it's a fundamental thing. So in culture grows by new, new words, new concepts, and when you, 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 you show that, you say, well, we have many new concepts which is in, in, in uh, artificial intelligence uh, 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 networks. Uh, do you think, I mean, uh, we, you can imagine, you know, artificial intelligence creating a whole culture of itself? I mean, are you optimist that we as human beings will be able to incorporate that culture into, into what we call our culture? I mean, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. So, I mean, I think that the, the bad case is, you know, we as humans use maybe 50,000 words. Um, uh, you know, inside these AI systems, the number of concepts that are being generated, you can easily generate millions of concepts, which don't happen to fit very well in our brains. Um, and so that's sort of a, but I think the thing to realize is that, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question because, you know, yes, there will, there, there will be kind of an inner culture of the AIs. One can argue there's already an inner culture of many natural systems, which do computational kinds of things. And in a sense, when we do physics, we're trying to understand something about that you know, inner culture of natural things. Um, and so the question of whether, uh, you know, how much of the inner culture of the AIs will be understandable to us, it's not clear. And it's not clear, um, and, and there's a conflict because the more efficient you want to make your use of computation, the less likely you are to have things where there are concepts in it that we can readily understand. So it's a, it's a um, uh, you know, this, this question, I suppose one way to think about it, you know, the, the, um, the way you put it is interesting of incorporating um, uh, sort of AI culture into our own. I mean, if you look at the, um, um, how to think about that? I mean, it, it's, um, uh, you know, I suppose that's a, uh, you know, what can we learn from how the AIs work? And how can we, we as humans, behave differently as a result. We can ask the same thing if we look at the natural world. You know, we learn certain things about, we've, we've developed certain patterns of behavior from looking at what happens in the natural world. I suppose the same thing will happen with, with AIs. I think the main, the main thing that I keep on coming back to is, you know, the, the what do you want to do question is a question which is a fundamentally human question. We don't even know. Which we don't know, right, exactly. If, if there was a perfect answer, you know, that have been delivered by the philosophers or something, you know, where this is, this is the perfect, you know, goal of everything, then it would be a different discussion. But that, that question doesn't even make sense. Um, and so I think that that, um, uh, you know, the, the, um, the role of, um, uh, you know, I think this moment in history is a pretty interesting one because it's the one at which uh, we start to make really serious use of the computational universe and we have to, in a sense, make various decisions about how, you know, how our human purposes should map into what happens in the computational universe. So, anyway, that's... Um, I think we could go on for a long period, but I would like very much to, to thank Stephen for, for this wonderful and inspiring lecture. Sim. Você me empresta? Eu te não. Você não. não me empresta? Poxa não. Amigo. Porque estou viajando para a África Sim. e eu tenho exatamente o mesmo aparelho e sem isso nós temos frito. Um... Ele não está funcionando, ele é assim, ó. ele é aqui. Oi. Peguei esse aqui, você tem que achar algum jeito de pegar esse aqui emprestado com o É, então ele está aqui, só que ele está com o que ele está indo para a África. Para a África e sem isso eu não posso usar as minhas palestras.